Now, sisters and brothers, if that doesn't get your pulse racing, have your neighbors check. You may not be alive. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank Six you. dynamic voices. Wow, what a way to start out. Good morning, everybody. I can assure you from this viewpoint, I can't see any of you. Uh, but behind me and on either side, that's my grandfather. <laughs> Trust me, it'll happen to you. It'll happen to you. Uh, my name is uh, Gary Stauffer. I work for NMPP Energy in Lincoln, Nebraska. And this year I've had the great honor of serving the chair of American Public Power Association. So I want to welcome the delegates and guests to the December or De Denver 2014 APPA National Conference. APPA is the national service organization representing public power interests in Washington, D.C. and providing quality services such as this conference to help public power utilities better serve their customers and communities. This is the largest public power meeting of the year with approximately 1,300 attendees. The format for this year's conference includes general sessions at the beginning and end of each day and smaller informal breakout sessions in the mornings and afternoons. All of the conference events will be held here at the Sheridan. The annual association business meeting will be held tomorrow afternoon at 4.15. I encourage you all to attend this important meeting. This year's Public Power Expo, featuring more than 100 companies that serve public power, opens for a preview at 1.30 p.m. today. The opening Expo Grand Reception will begin at 4 p.m. in the Plaza Ballroom. Please support our sponsors and industry partners by joining us this afternoon. Tomorrow evening at 8 p.m., we invite you to join us for a special concert for conference delegates and guests. The conference will feature the Fab Four, the ultimate Beatles tribute band who will transport you back to the 60s. And in case you need help, there's a, a municipal medicine dispensary down the street. <laughs> I think I forgot the 60s. Uh, that's going to be here in the Grand Ballroom. Uh, badges are required uh, for entry to all conference sessions and events. We request that everyone please silence these weapons of mass distraction. <laughs> I've been traveling all over the United States for the last 12 months. You know what people are doing? Right. That's it. So put them away. You won't miss anything and you could enjoy and learn something. We request that you also look for the exits in this room. They're on either side in case there was an event that you would need to exit. We want to make sure you know where it is. I want to recognize our entertainment this morning, six dynamic uh, voices. You're fantastic. You really are. Thank you. Now, please all rise as we sing the national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held as a twilight and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so
start off. Seated in the two rows in front of me is your board of directors. And I have to tell you that I have had the honor to work with this group this year, and it was truly an honor. Uh, they are sophisticated leaders of the industry. Job one this year was to find a replacement for our retiring president and CEO, Mark Grisson. Mark had big shoes to fill, he did a great job, and he gave us a challenge, and that was find someone better. This board went to work on that activity. They dedicated a lot of time and effort, a lot of thought, a lot of discussion. I was very proud of the accomplishment, and today you will be reintroduced to your new president and CEO, Sue Kelly. I am forever humbled and grateful to work with this group, your leaders in public power. Please rise, turn around and be recognized. Last Friday, more than 100 conference attendees and guests volunteered for the seventh annual Public Power Day of Giving. Volunteers worked in two locations, in Lyons, Colorado, where volunteers assisted with the flood recovery efforts from the floods of September 2013, and here in Denver at the Action Center, where volunteers prepared supplies, including food and clothing, to meet basic human needs of members of the community seeking immediate help. On behalf of APPA and these organizations, we thank the Public Power Day of Giving volunteers and sponsors whose generosity made this event possible. The 10 Day of Giving sponsors are listed in your conference program, and please thank them. Anybody that's ever participated in that understands what a great event it is to work together. It is the essence of public power, and we thank all the volunteers and encourage each of you to volunteer next year in Minneapolis. You will be rewarded. You'll enjoy it. It's my pleasure now to introduce the Honorable Deanna DeJet, U.S. House of Representatives from the district right here in Denver. Chief Deputy Whip to get is serving her ninth term in Congress as represented for the first district of Colorado. She started when she was 14. 12. 12. 12. Thank you. 12. As a member of the Committee on Energy and Commerce, a committee with vast jurisdiction over health care, trade, business, technology, food safety, and consumer protection, she is one of the leading voices in the health care debate in this country. She also serves as the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations, which conducts the oversight of and investigations into issues falling under the jurisdiction of the full committee. As a member of the Democratic leadership, she played a vital role in the reauthorization of the Children's Health Insurance Program, has fought for tough food safety legislation, and was a key player in crafting a comprehensive consumer product safety bill. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Deanna DeJet.
you so much, Gary, and, and uh, thank you all for coming this morning. I, I've got to appreciate a group that starts their conference with the after-dinner entertainment. <laughs> I, I think that's great because it gets everybody going. Gary was trying to get, I don't know if you noticed this, he was trying to get me and Sue to get up and dance with him, but after what happened to Eric Cantor last week, I think politicians have to be very, very careful with the re-election coming up this fall. Otherwise, I would have been right up there. Uh, you are in the heart of the first congressional district of Colorado, my district. And um, if you haven't been outside yet this morning, go outside. It's a picture-perfect morning, just like every morning is in Denver, Colorado. And all of our musical groups are just like six dynamic voices here in Denver. It's, it's um, pretty perfect in every way, just like Mary Poppins says. So I, I do want to welcome you here. I'm thrilled you're all here. Um, I'm, I would urge you to go out and spend lots of money, even at that uh, local establishment <laughs> Gary was talking about. But do comply. I know many of you are local elected officials, and so as one of your compadres, I will tell you, do comply with all local laws, laws and regulations if you do that. Uh, we don't want to see that newspaper headline. So as you collaborate on the latest issues that you're facing, uh, you've got a colleague from Colorado uh, who's likely dealing with the very same challenges. Of course, we have our two senators here in Colorado, and we have seven House members. We also have 29 municipal electric systems in this state that provide power to 18% of Colorado's electric customers. From the Fleming Light Department and their 201 customers in the North east corner of the state to Colorado Springs utilities in our most populous county, we have the full spectrum of public utilities here serving the people of our communities. And just a few miles up the road, the city of Boulder is contemplating a switch to local control so that their power citizens can shift more of their portfolio into renewable energies. As Boulders, Boulderites choose to make clean energy a priority in their community, a municipal Municipal utility would offer them a level of involvement that they don't feel they could otherwise have. So given everything that is happening uh, both in your states and local governments and nationally with energy issues, I'm sure these few, next few days will be busy ones for all of you with a lot to discuss. And I want you to know the issues that you're discussing at your conference are the same types of issues that my colleagues and I are facing in Congress. And we're keenly interested in what you're doing and how we can work together to make smart policy that will benefit your customers and your communities. Uh, now you heard, um, I'm now a senior member of the Energy and Commerce Committee in the House, and you heard about all of my health care um, and my consumer protection work and so on on that committee. But as is implied by the title, Energy and Commerce, one of our chief issues is energy and the environment on that committee. And I've worked a lot, I'll talk about this in a minute, on energy issues as well. Uh, the issue that we're talking about right now, of course, is EPA's new proposal from last week to, remove, to reduce carbon emissions. I'm sure this will be among the topics that you discuss, but while we're talking about the carbon emissions issue in Washington, I want to give you an example of how Congress can be a constructive partner even in a political climate. So often you read in your local newspapers, or you, certainly you see on the talk shows about Democrats and Republicans fighting in Congress and uh, not, not getting along on anything. And this is certainly true on energy issues. Uh, but there are some glimmers of hope. Um, last year, I worked with my colleague from Washington State, Kathy McMorris Rogers, who herself is in the Republican leadership in the House, to pass bipartisan legislation which will su support smaller hydroelectric projects and reduce regulatory burdens on them that were frankly originally designed for larger installations 
regulations. Uh, after working on it for several sessions of Congress, Kathy and I passed our bill unanimously through the House and Senate, and it was signed into law by President Obama last year, despite the gridlock that we see so often, because Republicans and Democrats realized that giving regulatory relief to small hydropower can benefit the communities that those installations serve and create jobs as well as creating clean energy around our country. Kathy and I got this done because the stakeholders in this community, both the hydro advocates and the environmental groups who historically have been a little critical of hydro, saw that the technology had made smaller projects more feasible while removing environmental risks. They communicated that consensus to us over at the Energy and Commerce Committee and we got to work crafting legislation that fits this area of agreement. And while hydropower may not be an option for each and every one of you, I offer this example to show that we are listening and eager to make progress when we can and where we can. And so I hope you keep this in mind as you talk about the unique energy issues that are facing you. I want to talk about one other issue that I'm working on that I think is so important for our country, and that is the development of a national energy policy. As I, as, as I said, I've been on the Energy and Commerce Committee uh, for about 18 years now since I was 12 or 13 years old, I wish. And, and, um, and what I've seen in that period of time, of all those years, on the committee that's doing our energy policy in the United States, is that we, we, t we don't have a long view. We don't have a comprehensive policy. And so we lurch from issue to issue to issue. We talk about what are we going to do about, um, about greenhouse gases. We talk about renewable energy. We talk about development of natural gas through innovative techniques and we talk about getting independent from foreign oil for national security reasons and also for economic and job growth but but we don't ever actually figure out how we're going to go from our energy needs of today to our energy needs in the midterm to our energy needs in the longer term and my concern is if we don't do that then we won't have tax policies we won't have environmental policies and we won't have uh, uh, partnerships with state and local governments that will help us develop clean domestic energy at a, at a reasonable cost and the partnerships that we need to have to make that happen. And so Last year, I teamed up with a colleague of mine, Congressman David McKinley, a Republican from uh, West Virginia, to develop a commission that would create a national energy policy. It seems so simple. How could anybody disagree? And so, yet, we haven't been able to pass this bill through this gridlock Congress, but we have faith that, that this will happen, not, if not sooner than later. Uh, it's that kind of common sense bipartisanship that we need more of in Congress and it's that kind of common sense bipartisanship that you can help with because as you talk in your communities about um, about energy use and utilities you're not thinking if there's a D or an R after somebody's name you're thinking about how this is going to impact your community and so I would urge all of you get to know your members of Congress get to be their friend and talk to them about the very real needs that you have and the partnerships that we cre can create. When we, when we do that, then, I think we will truly move forward into this 21st century, and we will create an energy policy that will benefit all Americans. So again, thank you for coming to my district. Thank you for coming to Colorado, and best of luck in your, in your deliberations these next few days. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative DeGette. I want to thank the uh, Local Arrangements Committee, chaired by Dan Hodges, uh, Executive Director of uh, the Colorado Association of Municipal Utilities, which we are a member of, and they did a lot of work hosting this and making sure you're comfortable and have a lot of fun. So Dan and the local team, thank you very much.
And now I get to introduce somebody that you already know, but she's in a different role. Sue Kelly has been president and CEO of the American Public Power Association since April 1st, 2014. I thought that was a cruel joke that Mark paid on his on Sue, April Fool's Day. Prior to becoming president and CEO, Sue was APPA's senior vice president of policy analysis and general counsel. Previously, she was a principal with the Washington, D.C. law firm of Miller, Bayless, and O'Neill, and served as senior regulatory counsel for the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. I've been in Sue's orbit for about a decade, and I can tell you, and you all know this, she is intelligent, articulate, and very witty. She is well known for her sense of humor and descriptive analogies. I call them Kellyisms. I have quite a collection of Kellyisms. So hang out with our new president and CEO and pick out your favorite Kellyism. Sue, please. Good morning. I can't see you out there, but I know you're beautiful. Um, welcome to Denver and APPA's 2014 National Conference. As you know, I took over as President and CEO of APPA on April the 1st. But only 10 days later, one of APPA's founding fathers, Alex Radin, passed away. He was APPA CEO for 35 years. We have a short video tribute to him right now. Alex Radin was the face of the public power industry in Washington, D.C. for more than three decades. He joined the three-person staff at the American Public Power Association in 1948 as editor of Public Power magazine. Three years later, he was chosen to lead the organization as executive director, a position he would hold until 1986. Under his leadership, APPA emerged as a respected and effective representative of public power interests before Congress, the White House, and federal agencies. In large part through his efforts, public power utilities gained recognition as progressive, consumer-owned providers of electricity, entities that work to keep electricity affordable. At the same time, Raiden launched a campaign to support joint action agencies and expanded the association's educational offerings. After his retirement in 1986, Raiden continued to work for public power as a consultant. He also chaired federal commissions on vital power industry issues and helped found the Consumer Federation of America. In 2003, Raiden published Public Power, Private Life, a look at his career and the changing face of public power in the second half of the 20th century. Reflecting on his career, Raiden wrote, the period during which I served in the public power sector was one of the most exciting and eventful eras in the history of the electric industry. There are now new challenges. The lessons learned from history should be useful in setting a path for the future of public power and the entire electric industry. The timing of all this has gotten me thinking. I only met Alex a few times, most notably when he came to speak at an APA, APPA staff luncheon in 2014 about his years at APPA. But when he passed away right after I became CEO, I decided to reread his book, Public Power, Private Life. I had first read it when I joined APPA in 2004. A copy was put in my hands on my very first day and I was told, read this book. And I dutifully did. 
But now, 10 years on, and having assumed the very position that he held for so long, it meant so much more to me the second time around. I was struck by how similar the policy battles we are fighting now are to the ones that he fought those years ago, and by how relevant the example of his leadership is to the challenges that we now face. I look at the array of tough choices facing APP, and I ask myself, what would Alex do? I say this in part because in the months since my promotion was announced, many people have congratulated me and at the very same time given me their condolences. <laughs> a typical response would be, boy, you're taking this job at a really tough time and good luck because you're going to need it. <laughs> These sentiments reminded me of the wise advice of one of my all-time management role models, Gandalf the Grey, the wise wizard from The Lord of the Rings. He observed that it's not for us to decide what times we get to live in. Instead, all we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. And I'm sure that Alex sometimes wished he did not have to deal with the issues that were given to him during his 35 years at APPA's helm. But he did not shrink from the task. He made the most of the times that were given to him, and in so doing, he left you and me with an incredible legacy. The legacy of public power, customer-owned and not-for-profit. The legacy of a solid infrastructure and a good business model for public power. And the legacy of strong and principled leadership for public power through a well respected trade association, APPA. As a young boy growing up in Chattanooga during the Great Depression, Alex witnessed the birth of the Tennessee Valley Authority and the positive impact that public power had on his hometown. As an adult, he became the face of public power in Washington for more than three decades. Alex's experience as a young man influenced the positions he'd take later as a passionate consumer spokesperson in critical electric policy debates. Through some of the toughest battles on the energy and environmental fronts, he stood up for the rights of the people, including their right to choose a not-for-profit public power provider. He believed, as I do, in public power as a force for good in our industry. Public power has survived and thrived due in part to Alex's untiring advocacy. He worked with Congress and eight presidential administrations to preserve competition and put consumers first. He left us with the legacy of a simple yet exceptional business model. Do what's best for your customers. Do what's right. Be responsible stewards of the environment and the customer's money. Listen to your community. Give back to it. It's the business model we need to stick to, even as we reboot it for the times that are coming. Right now, we're facing very substantial challenges, including threats to the federal power system, wholesale market dysfunction, distributed generation, climate change, and grid security. But with every challenge comes an opportunity if we can identify it and pursue it. And as we take these challenges on, we should be guided, as Alex was, by what's right for those we serve and what will keep the lights on, the rates reasonable, and the environment protected. Thanks to Alice, Alex and our public power forebears, we have a tremendous infrastructure. He joined APPA when federal water power development was a hot issue. He led the fight to secure preferential rights for public power utilities and co-ops to that low-cost power, so they in turn could pass it on at cost to their consumers. In his book, he cautioned us, quote, at some time in the future, Congress undoubtedly will be confronted with plans to sell the federal power systems, or at the very least reorganize them. Support Supporters should therefore be prepared to support the continued existence of this program while examining possible structural changes. And boy was he prophetic. We all remember the March 2012 Chu memo that proposed to revamp the power marketing administrations and the firestorm that that produced, which thankfully has largely subsided. But now, the Obama administration for the second year in a row has raised the specter of divesting TVA. In 2013, the White House raised in its proposed 2014 budget the idea of whether to privatize TVA. And in the recently released proposed budget for 2015, the administration called for Congress to explore options that include a transfer of ownership of TVA to state and local stakeholders. That could be state and local governments, utilities, or electric co-ops. The preservation of TVA, an organization that works well, not only marketing power on a fully compensated basis, but providing economic development, flood control, and recreation services throughout the Tennessee Valley, should frankly be a no-brainer. 
And as the economic analysis that TVA recent release shows, there's no benefit either to TVA's customers or the government in such a sale. It's frustrating to have to fight these battles again and again. But if the future of TVA is going to be put on the table, we need to make sure that the interests of electric customers in the Valley are protected, and we will do that, as Alex advised us to do. Another issue that consumed much of Alex's attention over the years was federal regulation of wholesale rates that IOUs charged public utilities, public power utilities, for their power. He rightly pointed out in his book that the vitality of this regulation would ebb and flow. In some parts of the country right now, we're seeing a real ebb tide. While the Federal Regulatory, uh, Energy Regulatory Commission asserts jurisdiction over more and more aspects of our industry. Centralized markets run by regional transmission organizations, and in particular the mandatory capacity markets, are not adequate to support needed new generation resources. They especially can't support the new resources that may be needed to replace older, less efficient fossil fire units that will likely retire due to EPA's new regulations. Incumbent generators are seeking new market rules to prop up capacity prices, but there is no guarantee that simply throwing money at that problem is going to get us where we need to go. FERC held a technical conference, which is really pretty much a legislative hearing, on April the 1st to examine the performance of RTO markets during last winter's polar vortex. That conference was very revealing. Under stress, RTO regions showed substantial weaknesses in the existing generation fleet and in the interface between natural gas and electric markets. Some of the generation units the PJM had to rely upon to maintain reliable service are already earmarked for retirement. And at a recent DOE-sponsored public meeting on infrastructure constraints in New England, many of the presenters, including our own John Bilda of Norwich, Connecticut, said ISO New England's centrally operated markets are unable to address reliability problems and even cause some of those problems. Most recently, the PJM market monitor has said he thinks that certain power suppliers took advantage of the power of polar vortex to price gouge PJM and the consumers that PJM serves. Nonetheless, we're seeing possible movement towards a capacity market in the Southwest Power Pool and development of an energy imbalance market in the West. Public power has to be engaged in these efforts to advocate for policies that minimize harm to consumers if these things are going to go forward. We have seen far too much faith-based deregulation in wholesale electric power markets. It's true. <laughs> It's time for FERC to think outside the box of the RTO-operated mandatory capacity markets. We need to explore solutions that significantly overhaul the current market structure. APPA has long been a critic of these markets, but we have also proposed solutions in an attempt to foster constructive debate. Bilateral contracts for generation and demand-side resources should be supported, not penalized, and public power systems should be allowed to self-supply their loads with their resources if that's the local choice that they choose to make for their consumers. While advocating for more effective wholesale market structures and regulation has certainly been frustrating for me personally, I can tell you, um, Alex pointed out that the effectiveness of regulation of electricity will depend on the amount of pressure exercised by those affected by regulation, such as local public power utilities and consumer organizations. His words are an important reminder to us that we have to keep the pressure up and stay engaged. In the words of a wise wag, if you are not at lunch, you are lunch. And we do not want to be lunch. Another piece of Alex's legacy is the formation of our joint action agencies. In the 1950s, power planners promoted the concept of what they called giant power to leverage economies of scale in generation and transmission. Small municipal utilities could not individually and finance large units. So public power under Alex's leadership formed joint action agencies to take advantage of economies of scale. About 65 joint action agencies now act on behalf of individual systems and wholesale power supply and transmission markets. And they've done a very good job. But today, many of these ag agencies have expanded their scope of activity well beyond the traditional power supply and transmission functions. They are assisting their members in diversifying their resource portfolios to add renewables, 
do demand response, increase energy efficiency, all sort of distributed energy resources. And we're going to need to do much more of this as we respond to the changes in our industry. We will need to respond to and incorporate new technology into all parts of our operation. Technology, especially at the edges of our distribution systems where we interconnect with retail customers, is rapidly evolving. And we need to keep up. While central station generation is and will continue to be an important part of the electric grid, we need to broaden our thinking and incorporate new kinds of resources, some of which will be customer sourced. Most of us lived through the era of retail access when Enron pushed for customer choice and many states responded by passing retail choice regimes. Now we're facing a new form of customer choice in the, major of, in the form of major technological changes at the edge of the distribution grid where we interconnect with our customers. More and more customers are interested in self-generation and in reducing their electricity usage through new technology like their own smartphones, solar panels, batteries, you name it. While some of this is driven by tax rate and other subsidies, technology is going to continue to advance and we will see more distributed generation, more storage applications and more gadgets we have not yet thought of. We need to understand how this is going to impact us operationally and financially, and we need to work with our customers to find ways to accommodate their desires. Remember, they vote, they own us. In fact, we should try to anticipate these desires. We are used to being the exclusive power providers to our customers, but in the future we may find that many of them want to supply at least part of their own power. We need to figure out how to make that work both for them and for us. Bill Gates once said, we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will take in place in the next 10. Don't let yourselves be lulled into inaction. And you should not be lulled into inaction. You should be evaluating your operations and your rate structures now to ensure that we're ready for this new type of customer. We have a very difficult task. We have to balance the need of three constituencies. Customers who are going to want these technologies, customers who don't want them or can't install them, and those who lend us the money to provide utility service. We need to get this right and we need to get on it now. Fortunately, as Alex remarked in his book, public power utilities are favorably positioned to promote innovation because we're often smaller and new ideas flow more easily to the top. But the biggest regulatory challenge we face right now is how to comply with the slate of pending and new EPA regulations. The mercury and air toxic standard, section 316B cooling water regulations, coal ash regulation, reinstatement of the cross-state air pollution rule, all of these are upon us. And EPA's proposals for reducing CO2 from new and existing fossil fuel power plants are on deck. Once again, Alex's example is instructive. In an interview he gave to the National Journal at the time he retired, he said that given the controversy surrounding the association's positions, quote, I tried to be as honest and objective as possible, refraining from invective. I tried to deal with issues on the facts and on reason rather than on emotionalism, close quote. I firmly believe that that is what we need to do with the pending CO2 rulemakings. As publicly owned, not-for-profit utilities, we are uniquely positioned to try and find the reasonable middle ground on environmental issues facing our industry. As EPA wrestles with the CO2 regulations, the regulatory paths that it may follow worry me in different ways. Too much action too soon would lead to an inevitable negative impact on the economy and a possible backlash that will set the industry and the nation back and in the end will help no one. Too little inaction has its own set of adverse consequences. We have before us two cautionary examples that illustrate too little action and too much action, China and Germany. In China, a policy of full speed ahead development and lax environmental protections has covered the land and the air with pollution that makes living there a struggle. Thankfully, we have sufficient protections in place to avoid the thicket of smog that covers parts of China. The Chinese example, though extreme, shows what happens when government sacrifices environmental interests to support economic development. On the other hand, Germany took an all-in approach to renewables, especially rooftop solar PV through feed-in tariffs that it has since learned were too rich. 
By 2013, Germany's average retail electric prices were the highest in Europe. The average monthly electric bill for a three-person household was twice the average bill in 1998, while the average residential retail rate was nearly 40 U.S. cents a kilowatt hour. A large portion of the price of energy is due to the renewable energy subsidy. German industrial cu customers that use a lot of electricity are now being given more and more tax breaks to avoid that high cost. And Germany's decision to phase out completely the use of nuclear power means it's now increasing its reliance on coal-fired power. And it's importing coal from the U.S. to burn in those plants. This is truly a perverse turn of events. These two realities from very different parts of the globe point out what can happen if we get this wrong. So how do we find the middle path on CO2 emissions? Many public power utilities depend on fossil-fired units for their power supply. These utilities need to be able to use those units for their remaining useful life. This is especially true for newer and more efficient units and those that we are even at this moment upgrading and retrofitting to deal with the current EPA regulations. The current and the anticipated regulations have to be considered together and comprehensively. Otherwise, we run the risk of high electricity rates for customers, undue revenue losses for utilities, possible reliability concerns, and other adverse economic impacts that could hamper or even cripple our economy. This could cause an unintended backlash that would help no one. All of us, including in our heart of hearts, EPA, knows that using Section 111D of the Clean Air Act to regulate CO2 emissions is a very suboptimal way as a purely legal matter to proceed. EPA is effectively retrofitting the statute to try and deal with an issue that it was never intended to address. The better way to deal with greenhouse gases would be for Congress to enact legislation specifically tailored for this challenge. And as Representative DeGette said this very morning, Congress has been unable so far to speak to a unified energy policy. Greenhouse gas legislation, I wish, if we could pass it, would comport with the principles we have long espoused. It should be economy-wide. It should consider the financial impacts on consumers and the affordability of electricity. It should recognize regional differences, allow credit for early action, and avoid over-reliance on a single fuel. But Congress shows no signs of acting, and EPA clearly intends to do so. So hearkening back to Gandalf's advice, we must deal with the times we are given. We'll participate actively and constructively in EPA's rulemakings. We'll do our best to protect our members' interest and support sound public policy both before the agency and, if need be, in the inevitable court appeals that will follow. We'll advocate for reasonable middle ground solutions to address climate change that attempt to avoid the kinds of outcomes we've seen in Germany and China. We should also follow Alex's advice on how to deal with these controversial issues. Be as honest and objective as possible, refrain from invective, and deal in facts and reason rather than emotions, politics, or even philosophy. And as we do so, we should recall our history. In 1984, on Alex's watch, APPA became the first electric utility association to support enactment of federal legislation to address acid rain. That was a gutsy move at the time, but it gave us an opportunity to advocate for pollution control measures that would not create an unreasonable cost burden on electricity consumers. No doubt, taking a fact-based, middle-ground approach to CO2 will bring with it some arrows, probably from both sides. Politics has gotten more polarized since Alex's time, and it's harder to find consensus. But we need to remember we're in this for the duration, not just the next year or two. Finally, I want to deal with an issue that Alex did not have to deal with, grid security. This issue reminds me of the old joke, you are not paranoid if they really are out to get you. And they are out to get us. These days we have amateur hackers, outright criminals, and even nation states that are trying to get to us and our cyber assets. Physical assets have also been viciously attacked, and more detailed information is being shared about this in the media than some might think wise. Public power utilities are also being asked to respond frequently to severe weather events that impact electric service at a time when the public seems to have less and less tolerance for extended outages. 
Public power and the electric utility industry as a whole has responded to these grid security challenges. The electric utility sector, including nuclear plants, is the only critical infrastructure sector that's subject to mandatory, enforceable cybersecurity standards. We are now on version five of the CIP standards, and we're still making changes to them. In the wake of the Metcalf substation incident, FERC in March instructed the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, known to us fondly as NERC, to develop standards for physical security at critical facilities within 90 days. And those of you who are familiar with NERC procedures know that is warp speed. NERC actually turned in its homeward assignment early. It took fewer than 90 days to complete a standard to present to FERC. APPA will be actively involved in the FERC proceeding to consider this new standard. The Electricity Subsector Coordinating Council, a CEO-level group composed of IOU, public power, co-op, and trade association executives, is meeting periodically with high-level officials from the Department of Energy, Homeland Security, and the White House to address grid security issues. The ESCC is working on increased information sharing between government and industry and dissemination of tools and technologies to address system threats. And in the wake of Superstorm Standy, APPA formed a mutual aid working group. This group has made great strides in upping public power's game when it comes to providing mutual aid to restore service after storms and natural disasters. This is not to say that we have our grid security problems licked. Far from it. The nature and the sophistication of the attacks and threats on our system are increasing, and we're going to be hard pressed to keep up. All public power systems, large and small, should be assessing your own cyber and physical security posture, determining what gaps you have and how you can fill them. It's been said that the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. And now it seems that same price has to be paid just to maintain electric service. But if that's what it takes, that's what we're going to do. In 2009, TVPPA News interviewed Alex and asked him, what sort of future do you see for public power? His answer, quote, I see a great future for public power, provided that public power acknowledges the vast changes that must be made in the way electricity is produced and used and demonstrates leadership and innovation in adapting to such changes, close quote. We need to have a vision that spans not just the next year or two, or even 10, but we need beyond, to go beyond to look at future generations of public power customers. We need to continue to diversify our generation and demand side resources to ensure a sustainable future. And I mean sustainable in both the environmental and the economic senses of that word. We need to plant seeds, as Alex did, for the long term. Doing this is going to take intestinal fortitude and even some chutzpah, as Alex's own forebears might have said. But we in public power have a strong history of taking on tough issues and punching above our weight. While it is rare in Washington for any one voice or constituency to carry the day, we can influence the debate and the outcome if we are unified, believe in what we're doing for the customers we serve. That alone is going to take us a long way. So, I want to close on an upbeat note. We in public power have much to be proud of. We tend to hide our light under a bushel. We tell our customers about ourselves and all we do for them one week a year, in October, during Public Power Week. It's easy to concentrate only on the big challenges that we face and forget how much we have accomplished and the good works we do in our community every day of the year. Alex led a long and full life and handed on to us a great legacy. We should use this time together to honor him, celebrate the good that we all do in our communities, and recommit ourselves to the mission as we deal to the big challenges we have coming ahead. So thank you for your time and attention, and welcome again to the National Conference. Take advantage of the educational sessions and the opportunity to meet with your peers from around the country. And please feel free to catch me if you have thoughts on the challenges we face, because I will be here for the duration. Thank you.